The whole city is celebrating as today is the wedding of Sir Alexis Du and Marine Kreisch. The union of these two symbolizes the end of the long-standing war between the Alliance and Union. The unification of their family crest will create the Grand Crest, the Emperor's holy seal which will result in peace in Atlantan. As they were walking the aisle, Seleuca sensed that something is wrong and stopped them from moving any further. As she was going to rush towards the orb-like structure placed in the center, Urban stopped her. The orb started emitting darkness, and the demon lord of Diablos appeared in front of everyone. The two lords tried to use the emperor's holy seal against the demon lord, but it was of no use as he killed them both in a swing. This incident was later known as the Grand Hall Tragedy. In the magical city of Aram, which is divided into two by the Factory Alliance and the Fantasia Union, the union of two Archduke's families was broken by this incident. We see Saluka and Irvin heading to serve a Union noble who has asked Saluka for her service. She was displeased to serve under him, and wanted to break the contract but can as a contract between mage and master cannot be broken. Their carriage got stopped by some people on the way. As Saluka is entering a contract with Villar who is with the Union, the people wanted to stop her as they belong to the Alliance and don't want a mage to make a contract with the Union. As she was going to attack the people a man named Theo entered in his horse. He has a crest and appears to be a lord and he does not belong to either Union or Alliance. Theo fought with them and after a while was able to defeat them and make them run for their life. Saluka asked Theo about his crest to which he replied that he created it himself. His aim is to receive the title and return back to his hometown to become the lord and save it from the demons and chaos. As Theo is weak he was discouraged but Saluka told him that she will give him a hand. She used her magic to summon a monster. She told him that if he can defeat the monster and absorb its chaos core then he can attain the level of night. After some efforts Theo was able to defeat the monster. As Theo has reached the night level he can now enter a contract with the mage. Before Theo can say anything, Saluka entered into a contract with him. Theo Saluka and Urban enter Mesto's castle and demanded him to hand over his crest and castle. As Mesto breached the contract by attacking a mage before she entered a contract, he was stripped off his title and was asked to leave the castle at once. Unhappy with the decision Mesto went on to attack Saluka but Theo came in between and started fighting him. He was able to defeat him and take his crest as his own. As Theo was taking about having a talke with the other lords Saluka denied saying that Theo is going to enter the Union. Moreno, David's servant tells him that Theo has joined the Union in addition to obtaining Lord Mest's castle and crest. Happy to hear this, David decides to attack Theo regardless of what the Lords of Clovis may think. Saluka reports from Theo's castle that he has been accepted as the new Lord by the three communities under his rule. The subject of taxes is then brought up because the former Lord imposed high taxes on the communities. After learning this, Theo bitterly regrets taking on the role of new Lord because all he ever wanted was to rule his tiny, underdeveloped village. Saluka tells him how he will help his village after he returned becoming strong to which he agrees. Later on, in her quarters, Saluka and Irvin talk about issues with the local lords and who will intervene first. Irvin thinks it will be Lost Sick David, the Lord of Seavies. It raises the question of whether they should hire their own mercenaries given the man's impressive military prowess and recent hiring of mercenaries for his cause. However, Saluka disapproves of that idea, says he would rather speak with a friend, and instructs Irvin to carry out his surveillance on the local lords. Irvin nods in agreement and walks out. After Irvin leaves, Saluka calls upon her familiar cat, Sir Balgari. Saluka tells him that she wants him to deliver a message to Aishila. In the evening when asked why Saluka rejected a contract with her lord, Saluka replied that she dislikes serving a lord with dubious intentions. She prefers lords with higher moral standards, such as the first lord Leon. Saluka will stay on Theo's side no matter what. All he needs to do is uphold his moral principles when he gains authority. David and his army prepared to lay siege to Theo's castle that evening. Moreno, David's magician, knows Saluka and is instructed by David to look after her. The next morning, Theo's fortress is being approached by David along with his 50 soldiers and 5 mercenaries. Saluka lets Theo stay at the castle while she and Aishila, who just arrived, take care of everything. David gives his soldiers the order to attack as soon as the invaders get near enough. Saluka assigns Aishila to the center and Urban to the right flank, with her on the left flank. On Saluka's side she encountered Morina who deals a gentle magical blow on Saluka. Moreno intends to use her as leverage to win the conflict by forcing her to surrender. Everyone started battling one another from Urban to Aishila. 
As Saluka and Morina were fighting, Theo shows up and takes Saluka's place as Morina's opponent. For a brief moment, Theo and Morina square up, and Theo hits Morina on the left cheek. A fight between Irvin and David was about to break out when Theo interrupted, revealing that he was holding his magician captive. As a result, David gives up. That nightfall, in the hopes that Theo will one day conquer the neighboring countries, David submits to him and swears allegiance to him. In agreement, Theo accepts this and gives his crest the title of Baron. Priscilla Farnese, an agent from the Order of the Crest, visits Theo's castle with the intention of supporting him. Because of the notion that they are taking crests from lords, Saluka tries to talk Theo out of letting the guests join his side. To Saluka's annoyance, Theo still permits them to serve him. In the night, David prays Theo of how he has captured the approval of the local lords. Saluka advises Theo to adopt the name of the late hero Cornero in order to fulfill his dream of freeing his native Sistina as Theo's armies start to gather strength. Saluka has Morina conduct negotiations with the King of Seves, Viscount Neville. The goal of the negotiations is to get the king to acknowledge Lord Theo's territories as independent. Morina points out how delicate this negotiation is, but Saluka says she believes in him. Following their conversation, Sartorius informs Saluka that Theo's independence will be acknowledged by the King of Clovis. As long as he stays out of the King of Clovis's territory, that is, Sartorius, who is thanked by Saluka for his efforts, brings up the rumor that Theo is her puppet. When Saluka hears the news, she gets worried and meets Theo outside of his room. Irvin emerges from the shadows to inform the two that a chaos hazard has materialized close to the castle before they have a chance to talk. A blacksmith at the chaos hazard site reports that a worker's back became infected with chaos when the cold there erupted. There appears a salamander chaos beast as Theo attempts to put out the fire and Saluka tends to the injured guy. When Theo tries to fight it and is unable to cause any damage, Saluka asks Aishila to handle it. In the end, after much struggle, Saluka defeats the salamander by using her magic to take water from the nearby well, but its body exploded causing some damage to the town. In the morning as Saluka was tending to Theo's injuries, she told him about the negotiations and stated that they would eventually need to engage in negotiations with the Alliance. Saluka's mentor of best melodies will be the one in question. When Moreno returns later that day after his talks with the Viscount, he reports that the negotiations were a total failure. Given that he owns all of the territory, it appears that the dispute will be resolved on the battlefield. Theo's army easily defeats their opponent when the combat starts the following day. Midway through the battle, the Free Lord's army joins the battle at Theo's request, strengthening their attack even further. Their loyalty to Theo stemmed from their discovery of the King of Savis' secret plan to capture the Lord's crest for himself. After an overwhelming loss, the King of Savis departs, promising to take revenge for the humiliation he endured in combat. In the end, Saluka serves as Marine Kreish's representative in an attempt to establish an alliance with her group. After Marine says she'll give it some thought, Saluka leaves. Obust warns against letting Theo join the alliance since it will lead to a wave of other lords who share his views. If Marine declined the offer, she would probably have to take revenge on Theo, and Saluka would suffer the same fate. When questioned about his opinion, he responds that he is fine attacking his own adoptive daughter. Afterwards, Obust informs Saluka that her suggestion has been rejected and that Theo must immediately leave Seves and give up his land and position. The Waldland Order of Knights will advance with all might to retake King Savis's kingdom if they reject their requests. They will enslave Viscount Theo as well. Naturally, Saluka rejects the conditions and says they'll face each other again on the battlefield. The next day, Sir Balgari, Aishila, and Saluka ride in a carriage to the Villar Constance home. While traveling, Aishila expresses her contempt for their father for his direct rejection and how they now need to turn to Villar for assistance. Margaret, Villar's mage, greets Saluka instead of Villar. As a representative of Villar, Saluka makes an attempt to alley with Margaret, but Margaret declines. In the evening at Theo's castle, it is announced that King Savis's troops and the Waldland Order of Knights will launch an attack. Even if they are forced to surrender, it is hoped that they would win enough favor for them to comply with their demands. The following day, Saluka observes that the opposing forces aren't as formidable as first thought. The siege doesn't go well. Aishila loses one of their forts and suffers serious injuries in a combat with the Valdron Knights, but Lost Sick defeats the King of Savis. Negotiations to establish a truce between the two troops are then decided upon. Theo will give over all of his noble authority to Lost Sick abandon the territories, and drastically forfeit his dignity. However, 
Obust asserts that no compromises will be made and that the ceasefire talks would only be agreed upon upon Theo's death. Theo's allies are furious when they learn of the negotiations' aftermath, and Saluka apologizes for it. Obust and Marine, meantime, talk about how to continue the war at the enemy base. Obust and Marine are part of a small enemy force that is marching against Theo's castle early the following day. While it is reported that Villar turned them down for assistance, Saluka remembers that it was stated, at that time, implying that this was prearranged. And that's when Villar and his army show up to confront Marine's troops, forcing them to completely withdraw. In the throne room, as Count Villar unexpectedly shows there, Urban reports that Marine's forces have completely withdrew. Saluka wants to apologize to Villar for her previous impropriety, but he doesn't think she needs to because everything went perfectly for him. Theo asks to become Count Villar's vassal rather than ascend to the throne of Savis. Despite his lack of interest in the proposition, the Count accepts it. With that settled, Priscilla swears to keep following Theo and Theo surrenders his reign to Lossic. The Werewolf Queen and the Vampire King engage in a quick confrontation at his palace. After being turned off by the Queen's lip service, Yana, a descendant of the Black Witch, breaks up the argument. Emma and Luna, the werewolf twins, are waiting for their mother outside the castle when Yana greets them. Count Villar posts Theo as night guard in Alturk. Following that, Saluka presented Laura, Helga, and Colleen to the three mages. Margaret informs us that Milza Kuchis, the Prince of Dartanya, will be at the castle shortly. While Theo dusts the books in the castle library, Saluka reads a book about the Demon Lord. The two are told by Laura that they have been called to the royal room, where they meet the witch Zelma. Their first significant assignment is to find out why throngs of werewolves are making their way to the Forest of Eternal Darkness, which is given to them by Count Villar. Yana, who is flying a broom, confronts the werewolves who are following Emma and Luna's sense to the Forest of Eternal Darkness. Yana asks to travel alone, and the queen grants her wish. When Theo and Saluka ride up to the forest at dusk, the werewolf clan greets them. When Theo tries to engage them in conversation, they threaten to send him back home. The two Count Villar agents are granted access to his forest by the Vampire King's shadow. Theo and Saluka enter the Vampire King's kingdom as he plays the organ within the castle. The werewolf queen battles Yana, who is holding her twin children captive, deep beneath the earth, losing her right arm in the process. Rewind to Theo and Saluka's meeting with Dimitri the Vampire King and their question regarding the werewolf queen. Dimitri grows nervous when asked if he was the reason behind the incident at the wedding, and Theo gets ready to protect Saluka. They don't fight, but Dimitri tells Yana that the queen is with her in the castle's basement. Then he turns into a flock of bats and departs from his castle. Theo and Saluka show up at the scene as Yana is taunting the severely injured werewolf queen down in the basement. Even though Yana is upset to learn that Dimitri has left her, she decides to just go crazy. She swings her broomstick at the two but they are able to deflect it. The queen frees her daughters from captivity by changing into a wolf. The queen uses her last remaining energy to claw Yana's left leg, but in the process, she is struck by a magic spell that causes her to die. Saluka attacks Yana, but she is unable to stop her. After giving their mother one final hug, the twins watch her die. The clan of the werewolf queen, whose name was Clara, holds a burial outside the forest. Following the funeral, Theo and Saluka get gratitude from the new werewolf clan head for their deeds. It is discovered back at Alturk that the werewolf clan has sworn loyalty to Theo. In addition, Janna escaped and the twin werewolves are now Theo's housemates. All the Union Lords in Jalusia are invited to a meeting, which Count Villar is invited to attend. Despite his lack of interest, Villar chooses to go. Furthermore, it is mentioned that Margaret will turn 25 soon. In another scenario, Laura shows Saluka her magic before Margaret appears and leaves suddenly. But the implicit message she was trying to get across was obvious to Saluka. Upon visiting Villar's quarters, she is tasked with supervising Margaret's 25th birthday celebration. In addition, he gives Theo and Saluka the task of following him to the next Union Lord meeting. Federico Rossini's attendance is the reason for this. On the celebration night, Margaret expresses her desire to dance with the Count and take excellent care of Villar in her steed. Theo has Saluka dance with him after seeing the Count and Margaret do such a beautiful dance. Prince Milza approaches Theo after the dance and makes fun of him. However, Theo views the insult positively. Prince Milza becomes irritated by this, stating that he dislikes Theo and orders him to follow him outside in order to issue a challenge for a duel. 
After winning the fight, the prince reprimands Theo for lacking ambition and asserts that he is not worthy of being a lord. Theo responds, saying that although many have trusted him to reach his objective, he still has one that he wants to accomplish. Theo also observes that Prince Milza wants to use military power to oppress people. Infuriated by those remarks, Prince Milza declares that he aspires to serve the Grand Crest wielder someday, ideally, Count Villar. Then Saluka walks up to Theo and notices her nervousness about the whole thing. He agrees. Although many people believe that his ultimate purpose is death, Silka points out that he is compassionate and has the ability to unite people. Saluka responds, of course I will, when asked if she'll follow him down that route. Following the celebration, Margaret and Villar have a conversation in the Count's quarters. Laura will be placed in control of magical matters, and Margaret will leave Saluka in charge of political issues. The conversation goes on as Count Villa goes into more detail about his upbringing and the violence he endured at the hands of his mother, who shielded him from his father. Margaret breaks down in tears upon learning the truth and declares her love for the Count, who, while returning the favor, is unable to do so entirely because of personal reasons. Count Villa meets with Theo, Saluka, La Sik, Moreno, and other lords the following day. The agenda items for discussion include the approaching Union Lord Conference and Lassic's army's plan to conquer the Clovis, Forbes, and Ismia. Unnamed Forbes lords support the Union when their plan is implemented. When the other Forbes lords' whereabouts and activities are revealed, it is determined that Theo will take care of Baron Radovan. Having locked himself inside a castle, Prince Milza offers to look after Baron Brannies. As soon as the prince gets to the castle, he seizes command of the situation and executes each and every lord. Theo reaches the port city under Lord Lad and Torias's rule. Theo and Saluka's flashback indicates that the port city's lord is determined to resist capitulation at all costs. Since he does not actually want to give up, Saluka suggests confronting him outside of his city. Theo meets Lord Lad and outside his building in the port town, where he declares his support for the factory alliance. He will only settle the issues through combat as a result of his refusal to engage in dialogue with Theo. After hearing this, Theo makes it clear that he would also have to battle the villagers if he accepted the Lord's challenge. After Lord Ladin affirms this, Theo declares that Lord La Sik will arrive with his 30,000 powerful soldiers on that day if he were to withdraw. This revelation unsettles the local townspeople. So Theo suggests a middle ground. He asserts that if Lord Ladvan and his warriors engaged his men in combat, they would protect the townspeople and allow him to pass away with dignity. To the dismay of his people, he concedes that the proposition does appeal to him. Moved by the cries of the populace to attempt to talk their lord out of accepting Theo's offer to die alongside him. For the benefit of his people, Theo makes another suggestion, severing relations with the factory alliance and aligning oneself with the Fantasia Union. Following a thorough evaluation, Lord Ladin approves the suggestion. In addition, the lord, moved by Theo's tenacity, vowed to remain faithful. Laura tells Lord Villar that La Sik killed the King of Forbes in another place. Villar observes that the enemy's morale will undoubtedly be destroyed by Theo and La Sik's incredible accomplishments. A friend of Lord Villar, Count Klute Gallus greets him, and they start discussing about his recent exploits against his cousin. Following Lord Klute's bold declaration disparaging Marine, Marquis Dawson approaches them. When Lord Dawson tries to speak with Lord Villar about the issues he sought to consult him on previously, Villar just ignores him. Margrave Alexis Du shows in shortly after and walks up to Lord Villar. The two greet one another and Lord Alexis is acquainted with Saluka who he thanks for saving his life during his wedding. He then focuses on Theo, whom he finds admirable and would like to speak with one-on-one -on -one at a later date. As the party develops, Lord Villar introduces the two to Lord Federico. This encounter results in a brief argument between Theo and Federico about Theo's last name. After the party, late that night, Lord Alexis shows up at Theo's house as promised to meet with him and Saluka. After talking about a few things, the two bid Alexis farewell when they come under attack from Omerda assassins that Federico dispatched. After everything involving the assassins is resolved and Alexis is eventually let go, Saluka observes that the Rossini family will be kicked out of the Union as a result of this altercation. Theo and Saluka inform Lord Villar of the Federico Rossini assassination attempt and the fact that Marine still harbors affections for Alexis. The Lord then goes on to explain how the two Lords initially crossed paths, triggering a flashback. Urban is driving a carriage that Marine is riding in with her retainers on when she approaches a curious Alexis who is fascinated with the shiny pavement. 
Alexis confessed his feelings for Maureen and presented a large rose with the last letter he sent her. Maureen discovers that Alexis attends parties thrown by the local lords and decides to attend one because she wants to thank Alexis in person. When he gets to the party, Alexis steps in to break up an argument between Maureen and a young nobleman, knocking him unconscious. When he woke up in a room, Maureen was with her the whole time. He again confessed his feeling but Maureen again rejected. Maureen is taken to a location where a group of kids are singing a song under the direction of Lord Alexis while on a journey that was supposed to be in line with Lord Darcy's wishes. Layla orchestrated this entire scheme because she couldn't bear to see her lord look so defeated. After the kids finish singing, Alexis gives a silver penny to each youngster and has a conversation with Maureen. Alexis defends his altruistic actions when she chastises him for them. Maureen is moved by Alexis's reasoning and chooses to wed him. Returning to the present, Villers states that although he would be against a political marriage, he accepted it because it was based on genuine love. The subject of Count Villers' acts is brought up during the Union Lords' conference. Marquez Dawson strongly expresses how much he detests the Count's behavior because it puts the two groups' chances of reaching a peace agreement in jeopardy. Villar uses his knight Theo to defend himself by giving an explanation of why he chose the subject. Theo concludes his speech. Villar goes on to say that Theo only picked up the gauntlet that the Alliance had thrown down for the conflicts fought up to that time. While acknowledging that emotion, Marquez Dawson maintains that it might have still damaged their connection with the Wallland. Villar responds by pointing out that Wallland turned down Theo's invitation to join them, which is why Theo asked for his help. This leads Dawson, who was supported by two other lords, to contend that Villar ought to have turned down Theo's offer of assistance. Villar boldly declares that he will assist everyone in the Union, particularly those who are being attacked. Dawson suggests stopping Sea King Eric from besieging Breadland. Villar concurs, defending the objectives of the Union. Lord Alexis concurs with the ruling. Villar refused to become the Emperor as his grandfather would not condone his grandsons engaging in combat. Commenting on the current situation, Lord Dawson suggests that they attempt to talk with the Alliance once more. After that, a vote is taken, and all of the Lords agree that they should attempt to negotiate with the Alliance. When Obus tells Maureen of this, she gives him the command to get her army ready to assault Stark. Count Villar is urged to fight alongside Lord Pavel Murado in order to repel the Waldland soldiers' invasion. Even though Lord Milza and Saluka think Lord Villar ought to agree, he still says no. In order to preserve face for breaking up relations with the Fantasia Union and avoid receiving Lord Alexis' wrath, he made the decision to refuse to assist Lord Pavel. After settling that, Lord Villar formally declines to assist Pavel and proposes that his cousin Marine should rule over him. Lord Pavel is upset by this and departs from the meeting feeling let down by the result. Theo and Saluka talk about the impending battle while riding horses outside the Villar compound. The next day, they go by a community that was formerly under the vampire Dimitri's control. Theo says he's heading toward the Boltava border when he passes through that area. The two travel through a forest and seek cover from the heavy rain in a tree that has a homemade cave inside of it. Theo's voyage as a lone wanderer up until he met Saluka is then discussed by the two. The result of this is that the two embrace and admit their affections for one another. Milza participates in the fight against Waldland and the conflict between the Waldland and Stark troops. That night, Marine and her group talk about military strategies on what to do next. Implementing Obus' cunning yet sensible scheme. The Waldland army outguns the enemy by utilizing the miasma that is naturally occurring in the area known as the Rotten Sea, as well as some that is purposely generated. This strategy was employed to make the soldiers extremely vulnerable to the miasma's effects. That would make it possible for the Waldland to defeat them with ease. Marine tells Layla and Cammy to contact Prince Milza as she makes her way back to her tent. The miasma plan is put into action by Abest and two other people, and it consistently succeeds. Pavel and the Stark soldiers are defeated by Marine and her forces now that they are weaker. Layla and Cammy forward Marine's invitation to Milza in another location. He consents to see her and supports her cause because he now thinks Villar isn't committed enough to uniting the continent. He does, however, demand that they engage in some activity before he takes up weapons with her. With little hesitation at all, Marine consents to it and gives him her virginity. Obus tells Marine that Mills's father passed away and that Milza now totally owns Dardania. The werewolf tribes and Lady Zelma get ready to repel the Waldland armies that are advancing on them. In the meantime, Count Villar calls a conference of his ally lords and subjects to discuss the invasion by his cousin's soldiers. He suggests that a request for assistance be made to kill his and Regalia, 
and that Heyman also submit a request for naval support from them. In addition, Villar permits Loss Sick to attack Osral. Despite the objections of his younger brother Igor, Selge, Villar's sibling, goes to his elder brother's rescue at dusk. Killiz and Hammond concur to dispatch assistance to Count Villar and Theo, while Saluka, positioned at Dimitri's castle, assesses their available forces. Lord Villar has his subjects on high alert as a naval fleet that is thought to be that of D'Artagnan approaches his realm. When a solitary boat pulls into Villar's exclusive harbor, Margaret is the one who tells Villar that Milza has betrayed her. Then, Milza and his naval forces engage Villars. When it seems like Villars' naval forces are being overwhelmed by Dartanius, Laura and Colleen destroy the D'Artagnan naval forces while providing magical backup help. Following the fight, Villar discusses with Margaret the next fight and how he intends to participate in it personally. Theo and Saluka, in the meantime, consider how well they were able to enlist a large number of fresh soldiers to fight for Lord Villar's cause. Villar meets elsewhere again to discuss strategy for the impending fight. The Haman Queen Edokia Kalora defended Villar's naval forces against the D'Artagnan naval forces who were attacking the next day. Milza orders his soldiers to leave their ships and board smaller ones in order to make landfall as a result of this action. Lord Solon quickly steps in to save Selge and his mage Elet from a precarious situation with the Waldland soldiers. When Marine learns of Lord Solon's deed, she sends her forces against Solon's, decimating them and killing the Lord in the process. Following the credits, Laura informs Villar that Theo has taken care of the Bulza soldiers and Lassic's men have forced the Orzel forces to submit. Villar orders his two subjects to launch an attack on the neighboring enemy territory with this in mind. Marine receives word from Obis that the Waldland and Mills D'Artagnan soldiers have successfully united. In addition, he informs us that Lady Ulrika's Armada is scheduled to arrive at Castle Unicorn shortly. The Nord fleet is moving closer to Count Villar's fleet forces as the next day begins. Villar realizes his time to die because his naval fleet was severely damaged in the last battle and the strength of the Nord army is overpowering. Villar, determined to fight to the death, gets ready for war and gives the other lords in the area the order to do as they please. In the meantime, Queen Adokia's nameless magician forces her to evacuate in order to spare her life in combat against the Nord fleet. Going back to Villar, he eventually returns Margaret's emotions for him while she helps him prepare for combat. When Queen Edokia watches her ship capsize and the Haman fleet is decisively defeated by the Nord forces, she suffers a mental breakdown. A meeting concerning the Waldland armies that are invading was attended by Clute, Alexis, Dawson, and the Lords. Negotiations are pushed by Dawson, but Clute says things won't work out. However, Alexis suggests that they give up in the hopes of saving Villar, but this idea is rejected. Clute then declares his intention to attack the soldiers of Waldland in the north. Villar and Margaret encounter the Walden soldiers outside the castle gates upon their return to Castle Unicorn. Ulrich approaches Colleen in the interim and murders her. Returning to Villar and Margaret, Margaret utilizes a tremendous amount of magical power that turns her body to ash in order to repel the hostile armies. Villar, distraught by losing his sweetheart, enters the battle with a gloomy and angry demeanor. But Maureen, his cousin, murders him, and she steals his crest for herself. Following the fight, Ulrika, Milza, and Maureen enter the castle unicorn throne chamber and confront Laura and Helga. Laura kills herself as a tribute to Lord Villar. Conversely, Helga pleads with the invaders to let her heal the injured, even going so far as to treat the enemy's wounds. After granting Helga's request, Marine hands Mills the castle and gives him the authority to subjugate Alturk. The people who are still loyal to the now-deceased Count Villar are defeated by Milza. The D'Artagnan prince denigrates his erstwhile ally, saying that he remains a burden even in death. The surviving Alturk lords get together at Lassic's castle that evening and sign a treaty. Subsequently, a conference is convened, leading to the finalization of the agreement known as the Alter Treaty. After that is resolved, Queen Edokia suggests the leader. Selge be it, a lord suggests, in memory of his elder brother. But he declines, citing Loss sick in his steed as his nominee, since his objectives are to recapture his lost land. Conversely, Loss sick also declines and puts forward Theo as a replacement. There is disagreement over this idea because they want Loss sick to take the lead. Theo makes a vow to them that he would demonstrate his mettle in the upcoming conflict. This idea is accepted as a compromise, although La Sik will lead in an acting capacity until further notice. The next day, Marine sends Milza a telegram requesting that he invade and subjugate Regalia. 
The purpose of this act is to guarantee Boltava's recapture. In addition, Milza learns of the treaty that the Alturk lords signed but disregards it. After that, Milza and his army manage to temporarily repel Selv's men. Lossik and his army soon encounters them, and following a brief disagreement between the two lords, the battle is declared a draw. Even when Milza's armies withdraw, he and Lossik both enhance each other's strength and abilities. Marine, her army, and her magician Obist are told of Theo's military prowess outside of his castle. Marine asks Obis to set up a summit because she wants to see Theo in person. Theo accepts and goes along with Saluka. Following a moment of embrace between Saluka and her father, Theo and Marine discuss briefly about Alexis before shifting the topic to the Grand Crest. But those who wander in the dark will eventually make their way to the Grand Crest. Continuing on that line, Theo declares that he will pursue and succeed in the same objectives as Marine previously did. Ultimately, the two decide to part ways and reconvene on the battlefield. Theo and Saluka discuss Marine's ongoing affections for Alexis and her desire to bring the two back together as they make their way back to the castle. Then Marine hears the soldiers at Theo's castle chanting for Theo's love. It becomes clear that Marine was reminded of what is precious by this deed. The information of Clute's ambush in the north, which forced the Waldlin soldiers to retire, is subsequently given to Marine, who is seen to be upset by this. Saluka proposes that Theo go back to Sistina and overthrow the Rossini family once a fantastic opportunity presents itself. Theo would demonstrate his leadership abilities to the Alter Treaty members by accomplishing this. Theo brings up the issue with La Sik and his magician Moreno and agrees to accomplish it. Moreno expresses contempt for the initiative, while La Sik supports it because it would help Theo take the lead. We witness the Rossini family sharing a meal and learn that Theo's is on his way to Sistina. In preparation for his arrival, Rossini's army heavily taxes a village of their food and supplies. Theo and his gang arrive at his hometown of Marza on the island of Sistina. As she travels through the island's towns, Priscilla notices a number of spider demons ambling across the fields. Theo claims that the Rossini family permits the demons to walk freely in order to easily use terror to dominate over the populace. Salvador Rossini and Yana are having dinner when Theo and his entourage show in. Salvador chastises Theo for his name, and Theo promises to free Sistina from the Rossini family. Salvador uses his crest after being provoked, enslaving the other guests in the process. Saluka casts Flash since she doesn't want to endanger innocent people's lives. The group then flees and meets up outside. Irvin tells them all that there is an arts user within the search group that is now circling the city. Figuring that Yana is connected to the Rossini family and that the art user is the assassin who previously caused Irvin problems, Salvador assembles a meager 200-man army at the Rossini mansion, which the family assassin Bolts considers insignificant. Salvador, however, maintains that his soldiers are sufficient and asserts that Bolts can only be redeemed if he can kill Irvin. On the other hand, Theo's group tried to persuade villagers into joining their revolt but was not successful. Saluka proposes that they should head to Marza, Theo's hometown. Hesitant at first, Theo finally agrees. A brief flashback takes place on the day that Theo departs the island, despite Rebecca, his childhood friend, pleading with him not to. Theo and his party see Rebecca in the present, and they ask her to call the villagers to discuss business. Rebecca tells Saluka why Theo left the island while Theo speaks with the local leader. It happened as a result of a villager reporting Theo's father for using a covert storage facility to reduce tax receipts. Theo, who has no ill will toward the village, attempts to persuade his hometown's residents to support him. When he's done, he wants to go. But Rebecca advises him to stop by his father's grave first. As they were heading to the grave, Theo realized that Rebecca has sided with the Rossini family and is leading him into a trap. Theo assured Rebecca that no matter how slim his chances are of defeating the Rossini family, he will make a sincere effort to do so. After that, he asks Rebecca to return to the town and order everyone to leave, because the Rossini will probably make an example of the village. After resolving that, Theo proceeds towards his father's tomb, well aware that it is a trap. Salvador's forces meet Theo at his father's grave. Theo is attacked by a flurry of arrows from the troops' archers, but Irvin saves him before any of them hit him. The villagers from Theo's village soon join him, and Emma and Luna also come to his rescue. Disturbed by this result, 
Salvador uses his power to boost his men by activating his crest. Theo's army, unshakable, moves forward to attack the army of Rossini. Theo is competing against Salvador, and Irvin is having his rematch with Bolts. Theo causes the Rossini to leave by breaking Salvador's sword, and before Theo can catch up with him, Rossini's army cuts him off. Rebecca ties Salvador up at that point to stop him from running any farther, so Salvador takes out a short sword and stabs her. This infuriates Theo, who defeats the Rossini men and kills Salvador by stabbing him in the back with his weapon. The Rossini family withdraws after their leader is slain, and Theo gives a dying Rebecca, who regrets her deeds, an embrace. The Rossini family learns of the uprisings in the Sistina region following the battle-related death of their second son. Salvador. Now as new supporters of Theo's cause are beginning to gather in Marza, Doni declares he will destroy Theo and exact revenge on Salvador. Juzel, the youngest brother, cautions against that idea, and Federico, the father, agrees. To deal with the opposing forces, he instructs his son to assemble an army of 5,000 soldiers. Doni agrees to the plan even though at first he is opposed since it is his father's sincere desire to spare him the burden of being a father who has lost two sons. Theo and Saluka are informed by Irvin that Doni Rossini's forces have arrived at the village. Theo's men will oppose Dorni's to keep the village from turning into a battleground. Later on in the day, after Irvin and the twins find out about the presence of Bolts and Yana, Theo's army attacks Dorni's. To deal with them, they excuse themselves. Irvin and Bolts complete their rematch in the burned-out forest. Bolts employs poison daggers this time, courtesy of Yana, to defeat his opponent. To deal with Luna and Emma, Yana calls upon a demon. When the twins attempt to confront the demon, it defends itself with an unbreakable barrier. Theo confronts Dorney during the conflict and kills his horse. The two then fight on equal footing. Returning to Irvin versus Bolts, they engage in more combat. Even though Irvin kills Bolts, the assassin still manages to hit him twice with a poison sword. The twins take a moment to reflect before changing into their wolf forms and leaping upon the demon's barrier. They then assault Yana by slicing her back using the height of the barrier. Yana manages to escape, though, and the monster vanishes. Someone manages to overwhelm the army of the Rossini family, forcing them to retreat, along with Aishila, Saluka, and the village army. As Dorney gives the order for his soldiers to continue fighting, Theo overcomes him. Prior to Theo killing Dorney, two of Dorney's army officers intervene to save him. They failed in their attempt, though, and Theo murders them both. Dorney then lets forth a bold yell of victory. Theo unarms Dorney, and they continue their fight until Theo kills him. At that moment, Yana, astride her broomstick and reciting a spell, attempts to unleash a meteor spell directed towards Theo and Saluka. Saluka counterattacked by casting a spell akin to Yana's, negating her effect and sending her tumbling to the ground. After that, Aishila offers to help Saluka capture Yana. Juzel welcomes Theo and his men as they approach the front door of the Rossini family estate that afternoon. In an attempt to engage in dialogue, he presents himself to Theo and his soldiers. Theo is concerned about Juzel's willingness to compromise but he is comforted that it's just for the purpose of preventing more deaths. Theo agrees to the demands, and the war officially ends. Yana is publicly executed by the Mage Academy for her involvement in the Great Hall catastrophe. Theo receives complete possession of the domains of Boltava and Sistina, as well as the rank of Earl, from an Academy delegate prior to the execution. Yana offers herself as a sacrifice to call forth a powerful demon lord just before the fire is set to her execution by bonfire. Milza receives word in his throne room from his subordinate Telius about Theo's success and the execution. At that moment, a messenger shows up to tell his king that the free lords have revolted at their stronghold. Milza, seeing the fortification, demanding to know why a thousand-man stronghold collapsed in two days. Half of the soldiers were slain in a diversion attack that occurred during a surprise attack on the stronghold. Werewolves and vampires were among the diversion attacks ranks. Telius goes on to emphasize that this is now a declaration of war directed at Milza and his Arctic army rather than an uprising. Milza remarks that he was too submissive to Villar's people the night after he conducted his own surprise attack on the White Witch Village. Consequently, 
he will unrestrictedly focus his concentration on an invasion of Regalia going forward. Theo meets with Lossic and Moreno the next day. They also meet Laura, who is still alive as a result of Helga's poisoning. For present, she is Adokia's server. Theo urges Lossic to hold off for the time being, but Lossic wants to change his viewpoint. Subsequently, Moreno is asked by Saluka to assume leadership of the next conference. Theo asks everyone to observe a moment of silence at the beginning of the Arctic Treaty Lord's assembly in honor of those who were just killed by Mills's reprisal. Then he declares that he will defeat Milza personally and accept responsibility for the lords that died while he was away. At her castle, Maureen meets with Ulrika and Milza in another location. The topic of the conference is the capture of Arctic. Maureen has shifted her attention from Ozari to Boltava and subsequently Theo. Obus soon breaks up the meeting to let them know that Theo has declared his intention to retake the Forest of Eternal Darkness. Negotiations take place at Dimitri's ancient castle in the Forest of Eternal Darkness between representatives of the White Witch and Werewolf villages. They both decide to take advantage of the forest's unique geographical location in order to vanquish Mills's army. Saluka agrees when Juzel suggests obtaining soldiers from the Arctic Treaty. They are in discussions with the Dartani anti-Milza revolt to deal with enemy reinforcements. Regarding Stark, there are rumors of a slave uprising, so it would be prudent to take advantage of it. Due to his experience quelling rebellions and vice versa, Juzel proposes to assume the role of leader. Theo accepts this suggestion and starts the battle. Telius tells Milza at Castle Unicorn about Theo's scheme to murder him and seize back Arduk. Telius cautions Milza not to go after Theo in the forest, but Milza uses his authority as ruler to carry out his duty. When Milza's army enters the Forest of Eternal Darkness, the werewolf tribe ambushes them first, and the witches from the White Witch Village poison them afterwards. Until Milza himself shows up, a supporter of Lord Villar and his army charges at Mills's troops. The ruler then gives the command for his warriors to turn back and offers himself as a sacrifice to make this possible. At that point, Mills's forces reorganize and advance farther into the forest. However, they are hindered since the jungle keeps closing up the routes. The goal of this is to confuse and divide the army. When they finally arrive at the castle, Milza challenges Theo to a duel. But instead of accepting the duel, he tells Milza that if he and his men don't leave the forest before dusk, they'll be stuck there forever, locked in the murderous forest. While he is trapped up in his castle, Milza freely states that he will conquer the remainder of Alturk even though he promises to leave the forest. At Unicorn Castle that evening, Telius tells Milza what the likely plans are. Going back to Boltava is the first, and attacking the Unicorn Castle is the second. Based on the latter theory, Milza declares he will destroy Theo's army. Telius suggests that in order to strike the treaty forces and bring Theo out of hiding, they should send forces to the south to which Milza agrees. Saluka tells Theo about the invasion when news of it arrives. Given this information, Saluka proposes that they move against Milza using an army of volunteers composed of Alturk residents. Milza and his army notice that Theo's army, accompanied by allies, is approaching Castle Unicorn as they make their way back to the castle. Telius warns against the idea that Theo triumphs by sheer might, despite Mills's desire to confront Theo's army head-on. He suggests that they contact Waldland, Stark, and D'Artagna for reinforcements. On the one hand, Milza fears that going back to the castle would be a sign of weakness, which would damage his pride. However, he still concurs with Telius' recommendation to have faith in his wizard. Maureen learns of Oba's siege of Castle Unicorn when she is in Waldland. Maureen responds by sending 3,000 warriors to his aid, while Ulrika claims not to be helping at all because she wants to eliminate Hammond. Edokia bemoans the fact that she is now without money and supplies. So, in a last-ditch effort to boost the spirits of her army and subjects, she makes a pronouncement in the nude alongside her mage Laura. This gives Adoka's army the motivation to engage the Nord soldiers head-on. Theo's men are already constructing a bastion against Mills's army back at the Unicorn Castle. Furthermore, there has been no word yet from Ulrika or D'Artania's reinforcements. Thus, as annoying as it would be for Milza, he doesn't want to lose to Theo for the first time. Even when his mage, Telius begs him to hold off until Marine's troops show up. With his army, 
Milza intends to advance and confront Theo's men, who have besieged the neighborhood. From his position in the barricades near the castle gate, Petra signals to Theo when Milza's army moves outside of Castle Unicorn. As they defeat the army's southern flank and breach the barricade, Milza gives the command for his soldiers to follow him, forfeiting their reinforcements in the process. The army of Lord Alfred engages Milza's army first, but as soon as they make contact with them, they immediately retreat. Cursing that his aspirations of earning any credit for his activities there were dashed, Lord Alfred himself departs with his son into a neighboring woodland. After handily routing the remnants of Lord Alfred's army, Milza's army charges directly into Baron Jorgo's Key's army. The Baron keeps a journal until Milza's army approaches, at which point he prepares his own troops for the impending battle with his crest. Almost all of the Key's army was slain in the aftermath, but Lord Jorgo made it out alive and wrote about it in his journal. Even though Lassik's army was ready to face off against Milza's soldiers, they decide to diverge. As Lassik leads his army to cut him off, Moreno suspects that he is going to deal with Theo's forces first. Selge and his mage Elet arrive before they can join them. Theo, in the meantime, talks with his volunteer army about how they can back out and let the knights and lords handle the fighting because Milza and his soldiers are too strong. But they refuse to back down, saying that this is their war as well. Theo grants their request and uses his crest power to give them all more power. In another scene, Milza's soldiers leap over a barrier only to be met by a hail of arrows. Emma, Luna, Irvin, Aishila, and Saluka confront their boss, Milza. Even though they execute a strong combo against Milza, it is insufficient to defeat him before Theo steps in. Now that Theo is involved, Milza challenges him to a duel once more and to Saluka's dismay, Theo accepts. Theo defeats Milza in the aforementioned duel with ease, and Milza swiftly gives up on the fight. Milza's attention is subsequently directed by Theo to the battlefield, where his forces have submitted. Even so, Milza defies his opponent and charges Theo, only to be disabled by a single sword blow. Theo offers Milza one last chance to surrender, but Milza rejects his offer and is slain by Theo's sword. Telius takes a bottle of poison and ends his life to follow his master as a sign of loyalty. Now that Milza is dead, pandemonium reigns in his crest. Theo then reclaims Villar's crest in a righteous manner. In the throne room of Castle Unicorn, all the lords of the Altar Treaty assemble and observe a moment of silence in honor of Count Villar. After it is resolved, Theo, who is now a duke, becomes the new head of the Altar Treaty. In the course of this, Selge declares that he is giving up his last name and taking on his mother's last name, Stelia. In addition, he is ceding the Constance family's rights to his younger brother Igor. After resolving those issues, Theo suggests that the Union pursue the late Count Villar's desire for peace with the Alliance. Therefore, Theo suggests that they break their links to the Union in order to adopt a neutral stance on those issues. While this wouldn't worsen their strained relationship with the Union, it would also be advantageous for the Alliance. Theo asserts that they will continue to cooperate with the Union and oppose the Alliance in order to facilitate a reconciliation between the two parties. Once those issues have been resolved through discussion, Theo begins a celebration of their battlefield victories. At that moment, Irvin and the other Chamberlain enter the throne room bearing an enormous feast. After the Lords partake in a delightful soiree, Theo and Saluka have tea in her apartments later that evening. They discuss Theo's new rank, his role as the Altar Treaty's leader, and his humility toward the other party lords. At last, Theo admits to Saluka that he wants Saluka to be his lover, rather than his partner when he goes back to Marza. Obist informs Marine that Theo has taken over as the Altar Treaty's new head in the meantime. Marine intends to assassinate the Earl of Lakulas in order to drastically reduce the military might of the treaty in order to counteract this abrupt turn of events. Theo and Saluka approach Priscilla as she waters the flower garden the next day. They talk about Pope Leon of the Order of the Crest proclaiming himself to be the Holy Grail beside the fountain. Given that Priscilla was born with a crest that resembled a grail, this runs counter to the idea that she is the Holy Grail. The father of Priscilla was also the creator of the Order of the Crest, a group that propagated the idea that the world's disorder might be eliminated by the Holy Grail. Considering all of this, 
Pope Leon might regard Priscilla as a challenger to his authority. Furthermore, he will attempt to seize his crest as well, since it is the Order's vow to acquire all of the crests in the world. Theo asserts, nonetheless, that he would give it up without hesitation if it meant saving his friends' lives. Next, Irvin goes up to Seleuca and tells her that the Earl of Lakulas has lost his life in combat with the Waldland army. Along with being demoralized by the news, Theo finds out that Marquez Dawson has joined the Alliance, proving that he had a covert deal with them. Given the abrupt turn of affairs, Seleuca suggests that they go to Jalusia to see Lord Alexis. Even though they are no longer affiliated with the Union, Theo's presence is said to alleviate Alexis's depression. Theo and Seleuca are waiting for Irvin to tell them that Alexis would be happy to see them at the Jaluka Harbor. They discuss Theo's elevation to the position of treaty leader, his split from the Union, and Alexis's need to make amends with Marine. Alexis is hesitant to do so because of the alliance against Union conflict, but she changes her mind once she finds out Marine still has feelings for him. Then, driven by a strong sense of purpose, Alexis gathers his army and prepares to attack Marquez Dawson's stronghold. The Marquez is celebrating his recent win over the Earl of Lukulas in Marquez Dawson's fortress. The Marquez are shocked to learn that a courier has arrived to inform them that the Alexis men are on the attack. Waldland refuses to send more soldiers to Marquez Dawson as Alexis's forces encircle his castle. This is due to Marine's army's inability to send reinforcements since it is too busy fighting the Alter Treaty. Given this, Dawson asks Lord Alexis to grant his request for permission to rejoin the Fantasia Union, sending his wizard to mediate. After the Union rejects this request, Alexis countermandates that the Marquez give up his life, riches, land, and crest. Angry at this, Dawson gives the command for his troops to attack Alexis's men in retaliation. But in the end, Alexis' army defeated Dawson's, compelling the Marquez to fly the white flag. Obus tells Marine that Marquez Dawson has been defeated by Alexis' army, which surprises her. Eric the Sea King of the Nords is given the order to act against Lord Alex and to remain vigilant in order to prevent this from happening. Marine complains to herself in her bedroom about Alexis joining the military effort. On a clear, sunny day, Alexis's fleet which is well known for having a sizable, unbreakable iron warship, engages in combat with Eric and his naval force. Eric's fleet wasted little time in launching a full frontal assault on Alexis's ring-formed fleet. Eric gives the command for his men to scatter and overwhelm the enemy after weighing the benefits and drawbacks of this strategy. Then he gives all of his warriors more power by using the crest's magic. Alexis gives the order for his soldiers to raise the battle telco flag as the Nord army approaches his force at dusk. The approaching Nord forces are then confronted by a number of small boats manned by two rowers and an archer. Since this strategy is insufficient, Alexis gives the order to launch the ballistas, which completely destroys half of Eric's men. Eric defies orders from below to stay still and then utilizes his crest power to reawaken, giving him and his troops more strength. Eric decimates every enemy force in his way by ramming his boats into Alexis' ring formation's boats. When Eric eventually reaches Alexis's iron cruiser, he is covered in both his own and his opponent's blood. He is hit with arrows, impaled by a ballista shot, stabbed with swords, daggers laced with poison, and ultimately a soldier decapitates him. Alexis feels weak after this whole exchange, but he adopts Eric's crest as his own. After Eric the Sea King's death dealt a severe blow to the Alliance's standing, Seleuca attempts to talk Marine into a ceasefire. Marine asserts that the Alliance will gain control over both the Union and Treaty armies, rejecting the truce. Seleuca asserts that the three forces will settle the score on the battlefield, unmoved by this proclamation. She also shares her conviction that the Mage Academy was behind the Great Hall tragedy. Marine demands to know why Alexis joined the war effort just before Seleuca departs. In response, Seleuca says it was because he did it for Marine's benefit. Marine is disturbed to hear this because she has made many sacrifices to get to where she is. She still has the same sentiments for Alexis, though. The forces of the Alter Treaty get ready for the impending alliance conflict while also awaiting the alliance's arrival. The Alliance forces move in the direction of the battleground as dusk begins to fall. 
The fight began with Lord Nayuda's army leading the front, followed by Lord Shan's army and his powerful divine beast, the Juggernaut. The archers meet the forces and, after escaping, fire off the prepared crossbows inside using the unmanned scaffolds. One of the scaffolds is destroyed by the Juggernaut, creating a direct passage into the enemy formation. However, after it falls into a pitfall and is slain by the nearby archers, it becomes immobile. Seeing that there was no hope of pushing the spearhead through, Lord Neuda and his army turned back, only to be stopped by the Lossic army. Additionally, Selb's archers ambushed them. In another location, the remnants of the Nordic fleet, led by Eric's son Jurgo, confront Edokia's flagship. Edokia destroys the Nordic fleet by igniting small boats that are loaded with explosives and set off as the enemy ships are approaching. As a result, the army of D'Artagnan ambushes Lassic's army, which causes them to get distracted. Theo and his troops come on the battlefield as reinforcements, ready to help their old friend. Marine gives the order to engage Theo's army in combat in response to this action. Even before they arrived at his forces, Saluka, Aishila, Irvin, Emma, and Luna meet Marine's army and obliterate anything that stands in their way. Unfazed, Marine keeps moving in the direction of her adversary. But Theo's army is able to hold off Marine's army long enough for Alexis-led Union reinforcements to arrive. With this result, Marine's forces withdraw. As dusk falls, the three leaders of the Alliance, Union, and Treaty gather together to discuss a possible ceasefire. Marine declines since doing so will benefit the Mage Academy, the real perpetrators of the Great Hall tragedy. Theo then makes a second proposal, asking Alexis and Marine to get married. By doing this, the Mage Academy will show its fangs and its crests will unite to form the Grand Crest. Even nevertheless, Marine is determined to deal with the wraith of the Mage Academy by herself, even if it means losing her life in the process. Through this ploy, the continent would be made aware of the real enemy, and eventually someone would continue her quest. Theo attempts to talk Marine out of that attitude because both he and Alexis have the same objective, but she is unyielding. At that moment, Alexis expresses his thoughts for her and reaffirms his love for her. Marine is shown by Alexis's army, forming the shape of a rose blossom while standing in the battlefield. Marine accepts the ceasefire as a result of this and Alexis's assurance. The Mage Academy searches for all mages who refuse to break their ties to their lords as a result of the Three Factions piece. It also reveals that the Mage Academy is tracking every mage's wand in order to locate them in the event that they decide to revolt. The lords are all told the startling news of the Mage Academy cleansing. In order to unite the factions and create the Imperial Army, Saluka declares that they will battle the Mage Academy in Aramu. The Imperial Army will battle the Mage Academy in Aramu in the afternoon of the next day. The majority of their mages and the lords concur to remain with the Imperial Army. In contrast, a handful of mages choose to break their contracts and swear loyalty to the institution. The remaining wizards smash their wands to prevent being followed or overheard once the supporters move aside. After that, Saluka talks with Obist, her foster father, about the situation. Aishila, who still harbors resentment toward their foster father, eventually joins them. After that, they all talk about their previous disagreements, but ultimately, they make up. Aishila tries to kill Saluka later after they have all gone to bed, but Irvin stops her. Aishila freely acknowledges that she attempted to kill Saluka and planned to kill Theo afterward. Aishila, dejected and shocked by this development, admits that she is a spy for the Mage Academy. She has been reporting Saluka's every action to the Academy during their time together. When Priscilla shows up at the scene, she is exhausted, and Saluka is grateful that she wasn't killed. Subsequently, Theo emerges from his tent and calls everyone inside. Seated on a chair, Aishila reveals that the Mage Academy gave her the order to kill Theo and Saluka. Theo notes that she might have chosen not to follow the command and that she did not intentionally kill them. However, Aishila was required to obey since she possesses a mystical crest on her left melon, which will cause her heart to stop if she disobeys or fails to follow a command. The magic crest suddenly awakens, causing Aishila to experience severe anguish. Priscilla intervenes and uses her crest to break the magic circle, but doing so also causes Aishila to lose her ability to use the arts. 
Theo disagrees with her belief that she ought to be put to death for her crimes. This is due to the fact that Aishila not only purposefully avoided being killed, but also repeatedly prevented Theo and Saluka from dying in combat. The gang then talks about Pandora, a covert organization inside the Mage Academy that opposes putting an end to the chaos. Before long, a courier shows in, telling of the madness of several nobles and artists who appear to have gone insane. The next day, Theo and company visit one of the camps that is encircled by dead bodies. All of them were left behind by lords and artists who were unable to complete their missions. Pope Leone speaks to the masses about how corrupt the lords are, particularly Theo I in order to oppose the combined troops led by the Imperial Army. He so proclaims the commencement of the Holy War. Regarding the Order of the Crest declaring war on the Imperial Army, a conference is held. The Academy and the Order are thought to be related. This is as a result of the Order's members blocking the route to Arama. Although the Order only has 5,000 soldiers, they have 70,000 supporters. However, women, the elderly, and children make up a large portion of their unnecessary following. Priscilla intends to negotiate with Pope Leone in an effort to defuse the situation, and Seleuca will follow along. The Pope finds out where the Imperial Army is and decides to assault them the next day.